Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, small but perfectly formed audience. Uh, so we can make it as interactive as you want. So any questions uh, you've got, happy to take them uh, all through. If we end up going down a tangent or you want to ask me about you know, specific tennis players and all the secrets I know, uh, we'll, we'll see where it goes. So as, as Phil said, uh, my name is Bill Jinks. I'm a client technical advisor uh, in IBM which is a posh title for somebody that talks to clients and tries to tell them what they should be doing with their IT. Uh, I have a day job which has got nothing to do with Wimbledon. Wimbledon is actually my part-time uh, gig, so to speak, uh, obviously with a slight focus in, in June, uh, but there is actually a, uh, an all-year-round uh, you know, presence and I work with the IT director. Uh, as you can imagine, they're quite a small business for most of the year, and then suddenly they are the, a, a, a global focus, and that's where uh, IBM helps them. So I've got some slides that hopefully show us the story uh, about what we do at Wimbledon. Uh, as I said, I'll take, take any questions as we go through. So what I want to cover is the relationship between IBM and the All England Club, uh, talk about some of the changes that we have to deal with, uh, and try and do some of the parallels between this as a sort of, you know, very specialist IT problem with the parallels I see in my day job in a, in a slightly more mundane, you know, corporate enterprise IT. And there are parallels. Uh, then I'll talk about some of the things that we actually do, which is getting the core correct, right? If we don't do our service correctly, if we're not delivering, then it's bad for Wimbledon as a brand and it's bad for IBM as a brand. So as you can imagine, there's quite a lot of focus on getting it right. Uh, so we could talk a bit about that. And then we'll talk about some of the fun stuff, uh, that what we might call the smarter tennis. Where are we going with some of the data, the information, and the insight uh, that, we, that, that we provide to the club? Uh, anybody here work in broadcast media, sports, part of IT, anything like that? Good. I'm on safe ground. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's all about strawberries and cream and champagne. I spend all of my time swanning around on the balcony of Court One, uh, you know, drinking champagne, eating strawberries, schmoozing with clients. I wish I spend my time in a bunker underground watching IT systems. <clears throat> so IBM's job with the All England Club is to help them maintain themselves as the premier tennis tournament. Chief executive uh, of the All England Club likes to see Wimbledon's competitors as things like the World Cup, the Olympics. They see themselves as a global sports brand. They don't just see themselves as the best tennis tournament. So when they're thinking of innovations and, and reach and stuff like that, they are actually trying to compete with uh, the Olympics. Trying to compete with the World Cup is actually a challenge because they tend to happen exactly the same, same time in the year. So last year, for example, the World Cup was happening as Wimbledon was happening, and we can talk about some of the impacts, impacts that has. So how do they do it? Well, they want to keep public interest. They want to generate TV demand because that's a major source of revenue for them. Uh, they want to stretch into new media. They want, to, you know, they want to use innovation to be the way that they can say we are better than the rest. Uh, if they grow their revenue, uh, get some good prize money, get the best players, they will be the premier tennis tournament. That's their, that's their view. That's their business model. Uh, it's very interesting. IBM has a major business consulting arm, as you may know. Uh, we don't often go into there and say, you know, let's do some business consulting on you, let's diversify your business, let's all of that stuff. Uh, they're fairly solid on what they do. It's tennis, right? A lot of it is commercial exploitation uh, of the event. Uh, if you go to somewhere like Japan, the view you see of Wimbledon is completely different to the view you know, we traditionally see through the BBC and, and, and things like that, or being on site. So there's a lot of that goes on. So what the, what, uh, the club do is they get official suppliers who can add to that brand, add to that, that value. IBM is the official IT supplier and has been since 1990. So we've had that relationship since, since then, 22nd year. I've done eight, 
So we had the first uh, courtside statistics service in 1990. We had the first radar guns on court uh, in, I think it was 93. We had the first website in 95. And then we've, we've been adding innovation upon innovation uh, as we go. So, as I said, it's actually an evolution. So the two pictures here are the, the sort of uh, the environment I have to work in. So in 2006, that's centre court. So straight after the tournament finished, the bulldozers came in and started knocking down the old side, uh, the west side of, of centre court. That was a shame because that's where my office was. <laughs> so we all had to move. Uh, and what they ended up with in 2009 was uh, the new centre court with the roof structure that you can see there. And if you can just see at the top right hand corner of that photo, there's also the new court too. So in the time I've been there, we've had the evolution of uh, the new centre court, the new court two. And they don't stop there. This year we will have a new court three as well. So the old court two, the graveyard court as it was known, has been knocked down. That wasn't used at all last year. And in its place is a new stadium court, court three, 2,000 spectators. You know, why are they doing this? It's revenue, right? These are all, these are all ticketed seats as opposed to general, uh, general seats. So they get, you know, get more people in, get more revenue that way. So that is the constant change that we're having to deal with. So a good example for this year of part of the IT project is getting all the facilities into that court. So we, you know, basic engineering, so the networking, the power for scoreboards, radar guns, uh, Hawkeye, all of that stuff has to, be, has to go somewhere courtside and has to coexist with all the broadcasters' equipment. So there's a lot of planning for uh, you know, cabling uh, and facilities and storerooms and we're never given enough space because you've got all these people competing for uh, space courtside. <clears throat> so what do we actually do for them? So the core of, the core of our service is, is the scoring statistics system. And I'm going to go into each of these in turn uh, uh, to sort of explain the journey. So we have, uh, the, the picture's rather deliberate. It is really hub-spoke type you know, data integration, data publication system. That's what we're really there to do. And we take that, that data from the journey from courtside to the web, a global uh, television audience, and, and things like that. And I'll talk about some of these specific uh, systems. The way we tend to think of the, the whole solution is in two phases. There's everything we do on-site yeah, for the club. So that's one subsystem, if you like. And then there's data feeds to everything we do off-site, like, like the web hosting and, uh, and things like that. So we actually do, you know, there's, there's a, there is a design, although some of my colleagues would suggest, you know, it's you know, done with a sticky back plastic and things like that. And it can be a bit like that in the run-up to the tournament. Uh, but that's how we tend to think of things. So it actually starts courtside, as I said. So we provide the statistics. You have an umpire who sits on the court, and he has a PDA. Uh, but all he does is that that comes from the tour. So the, the ATP WTA, there's a standard system that goes around for actually scoring, scoring matches. That's all it does. So you, they pick the server and they go point to A, point to B, point to A, point to B. They can, they can say ace. I think that's about the only piece of statistical information they have available to them. They have the facilities obviously to do penalty points and all the, the actual running of the, running of the match. That's it. So that doesn't provide much information. So we have a statistician, and we've got some mug shots of them here, uh, sitting watching, uh, that's court 18. Uh, you can probably just about see the top of the laptops there, that they're, that they're sitting. So they're actually watching a court, in centre court in the booth. They're watching, there's an application there, and they are capturing up to uh, five uh, statistical pieces of information for every point of every match for the whole two weeks. Okay, so I think it's I think it came in at about eighty nine thousand points of information in real time uh, last year. So they collect the serve direction, so which direction the person served, uh, whether it was returned forehand or backhand, and how it was returned. 
Okay. Obviously, when they with the serve, it could have been an ace. So there's a shot selection at the beginning as well. So they go from ace, they go from serve, then they go to the return. Then we do rally count, which is how many times the ball has been hit. So how many forehands in the rally, how many backhands in the rally. That is the most boring job of the whole thing. We'll talk about how I'm trying to stop that being boring uh, as we get through the, uh, the presentation. So we do forehands, backhands. Then of course at the end of the point you need to know how the, how the point was won. So is it a winning forehand volley or an unforced backhand error? Right? So that, this, this, the, the system here is tuned in. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, we've done user, user testing, uh, ergonomic thing to actually make it really, really quick for how they enter the point. Uh, and <clears throat> they're capturing those six, pieces of inf six or seven pieces of information. There's usually a team of two because one of the people is watching what's going out and calling what happens. So there's, there's, a, there's a code. Yeah? They actually talk to each other in a, in a, in a code. If you sat there, go, what are you saying? Yeah? And then the other guy is checking. Uh, for the show court, centre court, uh, court one, we also have a backup person who's in a bunker who can take o instantly take over the, the, the system should they need it. As you can imagine, part of the, the, you know, our core reason for being there is the real-time stat service. So it always has to work. On those TV courts, which are the, 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 show, the, the show piece, uh, the system always has to be on. So we, we have double everything. I mean, and, you know, good old-fashioned double data entry, right? Because if one server, one system goes, the network cable, uh, anything like that, then we can just take over in instantly. So a lot of thought goes into those redundancy patterns, just like you would do in a normal, in a normal IT design. Uh, and yes, I have it's simple instructions like, if you have a drink, it's got to be in a bottle with a top, right? So the, the, the people that do the job are trained in the simple things uh, like that. The guys that do it are not IBMers. They are tennis players. So they are students uh, that we get in off the street. We train them up. Uh, they've all got tennis qualifications. So you have to have a minimal tennis rating from the LTA to do the job. Uh, it's a lot easier to teach tennis students how to use a laptop than it is to teach IBMers about the rules of tennis. Right, so uh, that's the way, that's the reason we do that, uh, and we train those guys. In fact, the training starts in a couple of weeks' time. They all have to come in, learn the ropes. They watch it on video. We have a logistics manager who who trains them all up. Uh, it actually becomes a bit of a competition for the team because, if you can imagine, at the start of the tournament, there are 600 matches to play. Right, by the end of the tournament, there's three or four on the last day. So everybody you know, wants to be the best. They want to be the team that, that stay there till the end. Uh, and they want to be the team that gets paid because they get a day rate, right? So if you stay 14 days, you get 14 days of pay. Uh, so there's, and that actually ups the quality. You know, the one question I'm always asked is how accurate are these guys? And I always say they're very accurate because I, I like a nice qualitative way of doing it, which, uh, which can't be disputed. Aces are one of the numbers key statistics so as you can imagine the outside world uh, there's gambling spread betting all that sort of stuff going on that I'm not allowed to have anything to do with uh, things like key statistics like number of aces fastest uh, serves and things like that are in that domain of being of being uh, bet better upon so getting the number of aces right is is utterly you know utterly required I've a couple of years back, it's probably about three years back now, we were in a, we were in a, in a match, loads of aces. I think it was, I uh, can't remember the player offhand, but it was one of these ones just bang, bang, ace, ace, ace. It's a world record number of aces for Wimbledon. So what we do at the end of the match, if you remember I said that the umpire on their scorecard can write down aces. So what do we do? We check what they've registered as aces and what our statistician has registered as aces to only find that we are wrong by seven. Right? Our count doesn't, is not the same as theirs. So yeah, instantly I'm distraught, as you can imagine, because we're never that wrong. But, and the club are getting a bit upset because it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a new number. It's going to be in the press. It's, you know, people are going to know about this. So what I had to do was I had to go to the BBC and I had to get the tape. This was a few years back, so it was still all on uh, digital beta tape. I sat through the, the points in the match, 
yeah, and I watch them back on video with a trained umpire sitting next to me, and we actually checked all those seven data points, yeah, and guess what? My team were right, every single one. It was the umpire who hadn't registered the ace. So anecdotes like that lead me to believe that my team are fairly accurate. Uh, since that time, we've actually implemented a new system, which means I don't actually have to go and run through loads of tapes anymore. There's a new online uh, video service where I can just say, show me all the aces, and all the video, f video sequences will come up in a match and just show me uh, exactly where they are. The other uh, graphic here is of the serve speed. So there's radar uh, heads at, on six courts uh, picking up serve speed. Okay? Uh, this is quite interesting because we have multiple technologies that can do serve speed. Uh, this is uh, sort of a Doppler radar. Uh, you've got two, you've got two heads or heads either end, and they're picking up the movement of the ball, uh, probably about that far away from the from the racket head as it as it moves, and that's that, that's the fastest speed that, that you register. But of course, you also have on the, on the, the main courts the Hawkeye cameras, which are video cameras who are interlacing those those video signals from about 10 cameras to get a very high speed video version of the the, the court and that's what they use for the line the line calling that you see when you see the uh, see that of course that can measure the speed as well so we have a gentleman's agreement of whose speed is used because obviously different technologies don't quite measure the speed in exactly the same way so the radar systems are actually ratified by the ITF for serve speed and the Hawkeye systems are ratified by the ITF for line calling technology but not the other way not the other way around so do I see convergence happening in the next next few years yes we'll end up with one technology doing a lot of these things where at the moment we've got we've got separate pieces of technology I, I was aghast to find when I did this presentation because it's, it's stock photos from something that the, it was a stock photo of me uh, up there. So that's actually me in our control room in the bunker, uh, keeping an eye on on things going. So, what do we do with the data first? The first thing we do with it is we give it to the BBC for their graphics production. So you're watching the match uh, at home and you see graphics like this come up. These are actually the new the new look and feel. Uh, for this year, so you see a top, the top left score uh, that, that constantly updates. So every time one of my guys is pressing the button, yeah, that score is updating. Okay, you've got basic match data that comes up, and then you've got the stats data based on uh, their, our data entry. Okay, so the service percentages is because yeah, we've obviously said what's in and out, and there's there's about 70 different uh, TV graphics. If you actually watched, you know, and I, because I'm a bit like this, and it's part of my job, right? If you actually watch the TV, and you 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 see the score happen in real time, you will hear the umpire wait for the applause, right, for the point, and then go, 15 love, right? And at that point, they tend to hit their PDA to say 15 love, and that would make the on-court scoreboard go 15 love if everything's working. Yeah. That's too slow for the BBC. The BBC want it to go 15 love as soon as the point's over. They don't want to wait the five seconds for you know, the applause and all that. So that's why our statistician's version of the score actually arrives on your TV screen before the official umpire uh, has actually scored the match. In most occasions, they match. Uh, there was a, uh, a famous match a few years back, uh, I think it was Venus Williams, Carolina Sprem, I remember it well, when the umpire got the score wrong. Now, it's one of those sort of you know, tautologies because the umpire can't get the score wrong because he's the umpire, right? But he did, right? And you end up, and the players eventually realise that they, he got the score wrong because they're standing in the wrong, the wrong place. You know, you go from the juice court to the advantage court and you know what the point sequence are. And then, they, you know, about three points later, the, you know, you could see the two players going, there's something not, not right here. And we had to back out our score, which was correct, yeah, and follow the umpire who wasn't correct. So you, you, that, that does happen. So once we've taken the data uh, and, and generated these graphics, what do we do with it 
after that. Well, as you're watching the TV, you've got McEnroe, Becker, Henman giving you their, their instant analysis of everything. Okay? Uh, let's just say they're assisted in that, in that job. They have a terminal in front of them called the, the Wimbledon Information System, WIS, which actually provides a real, it's, the, it's an instant broadcast feed of all the information that's coming in. So as our team are pressing the button, it's updating their, the screens in front of them okay, in real time. And it's updating all the stats in real time. But it also gives them, in effect, a portal for the whole match. So they can actually say, you know, let's look at some of those key stats set by set. Let's see who's winning. You know, they, they, they can slice and dice the data very simply, just point and click to all the various stats. So when you hear them say that they're not doing very well on the pressure points or this is the 15th break point they've got and they've only converted five, it's not, you know, the old days, you know, the, the, uh, they used to write these things down and remember them. No, it's all, in, it's all absolutely in front of them. The system's also used by, so I have a, there's a screenshot there, that doesn't come out very well, but these are this widescreen you know, monitor, sort of 20 inch monitor in their commentary booth. Uh, and this is just showing a, uh, a set by set view of a match. So you can actually see for all of the major, major stats categories, you've got aces, double faults, and then totals, and then how they do by set. So you can see the trends. So a lot of, a lot of what's happened in recent years is serve and volley has stopped happening uh, at Wimbledon, as, as the modern players uh, tend not to play that way. So you can actually use this system to show how you know, somebody's serve and volleying across the whole tournament. Did it go up? Did it go down? And in fact, you can go over someone like Federer and say, well, how did he change his serve and volley over the last seven years? Because right? we have all of the year's data in there. So if you look at the top bar... Wimbledon history. Wimbledon history will take you all the way back to 1877. I can't tell you the certain volley percentages in 1877, but we weren't collecting the data then. Uh, but I can tell you who won, uh, uh, and that allows you to search on player, year, event to get any information out. So you can see this is this is a key system used by press and broadcasters to do all their background research before they then come onto camera. So you might say to yourself. Why do I bother? Why do we create all this, all this data? The point, purpose of this system is to give you the most depth and breakdown possible from the core data that's collected. And it's only available on site at Wimbledon. If you go back to my, you know, why Wimbledon wants to be the premier event, what they actually want is the press to turn up, the broadcasters to turn up to make it the premier event. You could quite imagine somebody nowadays, as a journalist, could sit at home, watch the TV, have my website in front of them, yeah, with the data on it, and they could write the whole copy from that. They don't actually need to, you know, they don't need to be there to do that job. Well, if if the press don't turn up and the broadcasters turn up, it takes away the revenues, it takes away uh, the prestige from the tournament. So what we do is we give them more data than you can get on the website. So the website only has a has nothing statistically, compared to the depth of data that you can get uh, on this system. So as you saw, you had Wimbledon history, tournament stats leaders, that's a uh, favourite uh, function for the press, because they always want to know who's the top of, you know, aces leaderboards, serve leaderboards, who's the worst, who's been on court the most, what was the longest match, everything is that type of statistic uh, and that function basically slices and dices the data in exactly that so you can get a page of serve stats and then you can sort based on any stat you like and it will re rejig the data basically to put the, uh, uh, the, 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 the top one uh, at the top. Nothing particularly clever in that, you know, what is this? This is a web app, right? So we've got the data, the data is in uh, Pretty much most of it's in an XML schema that just grows as the, as the tournament goes on. Uh, and the data, there are, there are custom transforms to produce those, those stats. And that's actually, you know, under the covers, that's a, we that's a website, right? So what we make sure is when we're testing it is that you don't see any of those nasty 
404 or server 500 errors you know appearing right as far as the, the user's concerned that, that's the system it's very simple point and click right so it's not it's not a web paradigm from the user's perspective uh, but it is just it is just a website uh, under the covers the servers for that are actually uh, stored on site and they come in a uh, a flight case basically on, on wheels so those servers then they, they're about to arrive in Wimbledon for the 2011 tournament once we finish with them in June we will send them back to uh, my colleagues in the States and they'll probably get used at the US Open or they might go off and do do another event okay so none of the infrastructure on site uh, to do the web the web uh, systems is there during the year and it turns up in now and it turns up because we have a what we call spring test in April so we get everybody together to have a dry run systems turn up in April yeah then lots more turn up in June right we deploy everything in a week yeah and run the tournament and we pack it up in two days nothing's left it's all gone and then we do it again every year the advantage of that is it allows us to deal with things like hardware currency software refresh so because we're doing four, five, six tournaments in a year, you know, I haven't got a standing inventory. It's going around the world. Yeah, so I, I buy in that service. Any questions so far? Who wants to know about the longest match? Ah, yeah, no. That's a very good question. So we, we're very lucky in our team. Uh, to have a guy who uh, was a former IBMer, he retired many years ago, uh, to set up a company called the Sutton Junior Tennis Centre. Uh, it's a very well respected uh, junior tennis facility. Uh, and he's our tennis consultant. And he know he can bore for England. Uh, in fact, he can bore for the world uh, on tennis stats. So he works with the broadcasters and uh, the journalists to work out what is relevant statistical information and we will uh, I'll, I'll talk at the end about where we're going next in terms of statistics we give him some data points yeah and say we look at what we can do we're all techies we can chuff the chuff look what we can collect and he'll go away and work out what that means so there's a lot of work going on at the moment on uh, pressure points so how do how do players respond at a given you know, is it a break point? Is it when it's 30 or, you know, try and come up with an index of how a player, you know, responds under pressure, right? So that, that's one line of statistical thinking that's going on. Uh, and the other one is trying to produce a more general, I don't know if you've seen in, in football, where they have like the Opta index and the, there's the Castrol index. They're trying to give a, a, an overall player rating, you know, not just from results, but results and how they've played and stuff like that, based on an amalgam an algorithm of all the all the stats data so i yeah i have a tennis consultant not many ibm you didn't, yeah, ibm job role tennis consultant There's, uh, uh, anything else over here yeah so that's there's there's two things that we'll talk about one specifically but there's a thing called the wimbledon compendium I mean, it's a, it's a Bible about that thick that after the, every tournament, every single stat, every single, you know, anything you want to know about Wimbledon is put into this book. The club do it. And I sit there with that, probably not in the shot, but I sit there with that compendium and you watch all the matches going on and you suddenly see out the corner of your eye, hang on, we've got a men's, well, I was going to say men's thing, let's say lady singles going into four hours, right? That triggers an alarm bell in your head. So you, you, you go off to the compendium, you find what the you know, official longest match is, and then you start watching, you know, watching that to see if it is. So you know you're going to be under scrutiny and things like that. What we had last year, of course, was, like, if anybody remembers, was the Isner versus Mahut match, which actually took three days to finish. Yeah? And that broke all the records, and it also broke some of the systems as well, uh, unfortunately. So... Uh, the core scoring thing, you, the, the thing I showed you the, the, the photo of with the guys doing every single point, flawless. It worked perfectly, right? And it didn't hit any, any limits at all. Uh, the scoreboard on that court, which is driven by the umpire pressing the buttons, that gave up at 50 games 
all. Uh, the reason it gave up is because a lot of these systems are fairly old and come from the come from. Uh, uh, yeah, we haven't got you know, jumbo frames and gigabit Ethernet and all that sort of stuff. And what was actually happening is the way that system works is it the packet was getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger because it was just basically accumulating some of the stats information, and eventually it over did overrun the MTU on the IP packet, and it just stopped working, right? So overnight, bit of a fix, right? Uh, and that worked again. The IBM thing that went wrong was we have a virtual scoreboard on our website called Slam Tracker, and again that went wrong in the full, sort of forty something area. And the reason that went wrong is because we encode the data for fast delivery. We don't send it as you know a fully you know beefed up XML packet. We've encoded it down to you know, a must mean it's you know 14 games all and stuff like that. And we ran out of our encoding, right? So we managed, yeah. You know, and, that, and that's because that system came from the days when you know it we, we wasn't the broadband generation. We this was you know we hadn't changed that since 1995 probably. Again, a bit of overnight coding. Uh, is required, and we got it to 50/50, there, and then realised that they were going to carry on. <laughs> they were going to carry on, so we had to fix it again to to get those guys going. So it was 78, I think, in, in the end, uh, in that final set. You know, is that a failure of my testing? I was asked by all the journalists uh, at the time, and I said, well, both us and the referees, you know, the tour application that had gone wrong, had tested in in real in our test scenarios to double the length of, at that time, the longest match ever in terms of games. So that, that one match went beyond double the old record. So I thought we were probably fairly covered. You know, if I was going to write test cases, yeah, I probably still wouldn't have ever gone quite that far uh, in my test case. So that was a very real incident. And what's interesting for me is a sort of parallel between what I might call real IT, or corporate IT, and, and this is the fact that to respond that quickly to that type of problem, you have to have, you know, in, in you know, enterprise terms, level one, level two, level three, all within you know, arm's reach to make that happen, right? So the help desk got the call to say it, was, it went wrong. We handed it off to the level two application team to see what the problem was, right? And guess what? They sit like... There, right? They within five minutes had the oh dear moment because we're going to need a coding, a coding change, yeah. Uh, and luckily the programmer sits, you know, the other end of the uh, the bench. Uh, but that doesn't mean we don't do things properly. You know, overnight, what we did once the once the uh, half past nine, no more play. We've got the next day's order of play. Production's shut down. The test images, was, the test systems were brought up. The fix was, you know, properly release managed into the system. Was tested. We have data simulators. Yeah, so we replayed that whole match overnight and kept going, right, until we, you know, we, we were happy it was it was working. Uh, and then, you know, restored the production image uh, and then you know, carried on the next day. So some things are, you know, standard ITIL practices, but we're doing it in a much more compressed compressed time frame. We have to do those processes because it still has to work, right? I can't go, oops, if it, you know, at, at 12 o'clock, if, if you know, the first ball is hit. I mean, that is my most nervous point, right? My most nervous point is 12 lunchtime, first day, right? About 10 past 12, right? First, first person throws the ball up, hits it, and I am just hoping that, well, it's not hoping, I have tested it. But, you know, you, you, you've got that, yeah. is it going to work? They hit the button, right, and you see all the data flow to all the various different places it's supposed to go, and you have a bit of a sigh of relief at that point, and then you hope it carries on for the next next 14 days doing it. So, you know, my by training, I'm an you know, engineer architect is the new buzzword isn't it but you know engineer programmer that's my background in, in, in systems development you know for two weeks of the year I'm an ops manager right I am absolutely on the floor watching every system watching every match as you saw in that photo right checking things are going through because it's a real-time system so just as a 
I, I've talked for a bit, so here's a, a short video to give you some ideas of the things we do. one of the students who does the we button pushing. We develop and support all the systems that the club uses to put content onto the website as well as to compare all the scoring that on the site. We do about 100,000 updates to the site a day and that's both scoring and editorial content like stories and photos and that sort of stuff. We're also supporting more fully the iPad this year which is the Windows, the new hot device. And we've coded some of that up in HTML5, so it's not relying on Flash support, so that you can visit Wimbledon.org from your iPad and have a lovely experience. Very cool. The augmented reality is just a tremendous growth area for the phones and different devices. You know, it's available both the iPhone and for Android-style device. And um, I'm thinking it's going to be really popular for people to come. If you love tennis like I do, I think it's a better place you can be, other than maybe actually on center court, which is pretty excellent. If you look over there on the wall, we've got a 37% savings in uh, energy since 2008. So it's a constant method that we'll do through server consolidation, so we use less servers to do the same amount of tasks. Uh, we'll do um, a little bit of full infrastructure upgrades. So we have a smart server center now that actually goes to the and it is uh, cooler, it's more efficient, it is uh, overall reduced from the way that we've done these projects. So whenever someone goes to Wimbledon, we're trying to make it as efficient energy-wise and as good experience as we can. People don't really believe that you can sort of use this technology, especially with this year because it's um, live video feeds. So if you point your phone towards the court one, uh, center court one, court two, we can even update what the trains are, how they're running, so we can set the CFL, set the level running. So that, that video sort of introduces the, so what are you going to do with all that data then? Right? We've talked about what I've done with it on site. I've kept the broadcasters happy. I've kept the journalists happy. Uh, as you see on some of those things, I'm going to give it to the general public right, in various different ways uh, and various different channels. So Wimbledon.org, as Elizabeth said, or Wimbledon.com, as it's now been rebranded. So for the last however many years, it's been Wimbledon.org. The club have finally decided to call themselves a, a dot .com, uh, so it's now Wimbledon.com, uh, is, is the main portal, right? So why, why do IBM do this? It's to show off our, our web hosting, application hosting uh, capabilities. Uh, dare I say it today, maybe our cloud computing right? uh, technologies, because actually this is a multi-tenant uh, web hosting environment. Right, so before somebody invented the word cloud, this was already uh, doing it. So as uh, Elizabeth, uh, the, the, uh, the American lady you heard, she's our web producer. So she sits there running a team that are managing the web environment. The hosting centers are actually in the US. Uh, there's three of them. Uh, and they run a three active configuration. So uh, the, the basic design is 100% of the workload can be covered by two data centers, so the design point is, is 50, 50, 50, 50, which means you can actually have, the, as, as near as you can, uh, continuous availability, because I can take one whole site out for maintenance and keep, keep the workload going. Okay? I'll tell you some of the history of, of, of how we got to that. 
as Elizabeth said, there's about 100,000 updates to that website. Now, if you remember, I said there were only 89,000 points, right, for the whole tournament. So my actual real-time stats updates are really small when it comes to what's going on here. There's a web content management system. There's a set of photo editors. There's a set of uh, copywriters. Uh, there's adverts, you know, adverts going on. Uh, all of that stuff is happening in, in that website. And we get about 12 million uh, unique users in the fortnight. Okay, well, so this, you know, we're, not, we're not Amazon, you know, eBay level, but it's quite a lot for two weeks. Uh, and if you imagine you're a small, medium business, right, and you need that level of capability for two weeks, and then you don't need it anymore. So you're not going to invest in that yourself. You know, in the new parlance, you're going to go to the cloud, right? So that's where we're providing this, uh, the system uh, to do that. Okay, and it's about 400 million page views. We don't use hits. It's, it's page views is, is, is the stat. Coming back to my, my point earlier about things like the World Cup, if you actually watch our profile, you, know, you will see every four years it does a bit of a dip because the World Cup's there and it takes away, takes away market share, really. That's what it does. And then it'll, uh, it'll go up again. So can we, beat, you know, can we get good market share through another event? It's number one driver. Number second driver is, can Wimbledon be the best website out of the four Grand Slam ones? As you can imagine, there's a little bit of internal competition between the IBM teams that do, do the four websites. Uh, I'm very proud to say we're winning at the moment, but it was a close-run thing. US Open nearly got, nearly got to us, but we still have the all-time record. Uh, it's continuous evolution, right? So we'll come up with a really good idea. Then they, you know, because it's, a, it's in effect one global team, it gets incorporated into the next, you know, to the next tournament, the next tournament, the next tournament. So you've got to keep ahead of the game. So coming back to my web infrastructure, lots of words on here, but uh, how did this all begin? This all began in 1998 with an oh dear moment. Uh, we had some outages. We were providing systems for uh, the NFL in America. And they went wrong. Yeah, uh, you may also remember in 2000 in Sydney, the Olympics, uh, we had an outage there as well. Uh, we then got out of doing the Olympics because it was uh, too big a problem. But we've had some outages, which you know comes back to the hurting the brand, hurting the IBM brand, hurting the, the, the sponsorship brand that you're there for. So we thought we've got to get a grip of this, and this was the beginning of the events infrastructure uh, team. Uh, and we've basically improved this uh, you know, year on year. The last outage was June 2001. Right? So the infrastructure as a whole has been running since 2001, continuous availability. Okay? Uh, at around about, I'd say here, 2006, I actually stopped worrying about the availability of this facility. Yeah, I actually, literally, and a bit like our, you know, all our customers in the real world, begin to take this stuff for granted. Right? You expect it to be there. Okay. Uh, in the early days, when you know our web capacity was 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 limited, uh, and the equipment wasn't, you know, you were worried about capacity. You would do you would do things in the in the application to deal with. You know, spikes in demand and stuff like that. So we used to have capability in the web, in uh, the web application to take content away, right? What we called content shedding. So you don't, you'd only have half the website available, right? So you'd stop clicks that way. Nowadays, it's full function. It's multi-device. You know, you've got standard web browsers. You've got iPads. You've got Android devices. You've got the world and his wife coming in here, and it it just copes. Uh, last year. Uh, the U.S. Open Golf, uh, which is another event we 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 sponsor, uh, overran by a day, and it, they had their final round on the Monday. That happened to be the first day of Wimbledon, right? So we had both events running on the infrastructure at the same time at you know important volumes. Nobody blinked. It was fine, right? So we have we we've built something. You know, fairly impressive there. Uh, 
it has this infrastructure also has a day job, right? And this is how you get away with it, right? You know, the point of the cloud is it, you know, and you, the economics of the cloud type environment are you need multi-tenancy. So we are lucky enough to have a rather important tenant called IBM on our on our infrastructure. So we host IBM.com, yeah, but we also host all these lists of the, the, these lists of events up there as well with their workload. And you need capacity planning, right? You can't get away from some of the old-fashioned things, right? So that the events team actually have a concept they call velocity, which says on any given day of the year, yeah, the, 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 the system has that much velocity available to it. So it maybe we have scheduled maintenance for a weekend and might take a site down. So we could only introduce so much more change on the infrastructure as a whole. And basically every tenant plans their changes with us to say, you know, guess what, I want June the 21st until you know, middle of July, right? That's when I want my maximum capability, okay? And it's capacity planned so that everybody knows how we can put agile, you know, we come back to those fixes, who are the people putting the fixes in, who are they, how are they going to affect the environment, and stuff like that. So it's actually, uh, you know, leading edge web, web hosting environment, okay? As you saw in the video, the, 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 this phase, it's all been about infrastructure evolution. You know, we used to have 60 servers, yeah, and that's that's a systems admin nightmare. Uh, it's a complex distributed system, right? So those 60 servers became physical servers became you know virtual machines. Yeah, uh, we now have six physical servers, right? So there's two two in each of the three data centers. Now they're quite big, right? You know, it's a uh, IBM uh, System P servers, lots of uh, partitions on them. The thing that we're currently doing is uh, active energy management. So, uh, you know, part of the reason IBM does this is for marketing reasons. So what's the big marketing buzz as well as smart? Everything's got to be smart and green, right? So a lot of focus on the green data center of the future, okay? It is a journey. You know, not every data center is, is, is the same. One of our data center in Raleigh is now our leading, leading light. Uh, you know, we, we do now use active energy management to reduce the clock speeds on the, on, on the servers. So, you know, it's another way of just, you know, turning the electricity bill down. Right? And these are, these are the sort of showcase things we do uh, to, to show off. Uh, we use all of our own software, you know, so Tivoli monitoring uh, and things like that. That's a custom dashboard, so we, we write our own dashboards. Uh, but we show it off, and as you saw, we have 38% reduction in the energy consumption uh, over the last few years, uh, which we're really proud of. <clears throat> the other thing that uh, you may have just picked up in the video, if you run a well-known web presence, you're going to get hit by people ne'er-do-wells. Uh, this is a dashboard from our ISS uh, site protector service, which is an IBM company, uh, showing somebody in China, it's, it's, it's an illustration of somebody in China having a go at our, our website. We, pr we block about 100,000 attacks on the website a day. Uh, that sounds a lot, and it is a lot, but many of them are the classic uh, Windows worms. Right, and botnets that are out there. So you've got lots of infected PCs that are just trying their luck at lots of IP addresses out there. Uh, so you know the Melissa's and the, the things like that are out there, still out there, trying to do their worst, get anywhere through. And it also helps when you don't run Windows as your server operating system. Uh, so most of this is Linux or, or AIX. So we use our ISS technology to protect to protect the website, and that's protecting all the brands, in effect, that are, that are, that are held in it. <clears throat> so, what's the evolution been? What, where are we getting smart? Well, the first area of smartness is changing the device profiles. Okay, we've got websites. Everybody, you know, everybody does websites. What's the future? Well, as you saw, the future is these things, right? This is what uh, everybody's using. Uh, we've had for two years now what we now call the standard iPhone app, which just gives you uh, news, uh, scores, all of the stuff you can see coming through uh, on, the, on the web. 
comes through on the iPhone. And it, if I'm really lucky, it may even work still. Right, so that's the Wimbledon app. I can go to videos. So this is coming over 3G. There's a video that says Rafa romps to the title. Loading movie. Oh, and there it is playing. Right, so that is a way of just extending the brand. Right, so for the tweeting generation, yeah, they can just get the get the information uh, as they want. Now I can't turn it off. There we go. <clears throat> so we've had that for a couple of years. Uh, we've got widgets, we've got Facebook links, we've got all that social networking stuff uh, going on. The, the stuff that's been really interesting is what's called the IBM Seer, which has been a, a, an augmented reality app. Now I can't really show you this because we're not at Wimbledon, but you saw in the uh, in the video. Let me just I got the yeah. This is the augmented reality app. So the device iPhone 4 or suitable Android device has a compass in it, has GPS in it, uh, has accelerometers so it knows what its orientation is. So we went round the site and we geocoded the site. So people would go to every toilet say this is where the toilets are every food stall every taxi rank every court every everything right so that was all geocoded uh, and then what you do is you point your camera at the site at where you are on the grounds okay and those little you can see the the icons in, in the middle picture coming up yeah and as you drifted round, it would say there's I mean, some of them are stupid, right? There's a big building that's got centre court written on the side of it, and it comes around and it says, that's centre court. I mean, some of it is, you know, you are there after all. Uh, but it would say, that's the way to court too. So if you've never known, if you don't know around, it would actually help you go. If you want to know where the gents or the ladies is, it will help you. If you actually wanted to see, well, actually, uh, I'm interested in a taxi, which is the direction to the taxi queue, that's the way to the taxi queue, you would then click on it, and you get a webcam feed of the taxi the taxi queue so you could see how how far you, you would have to wait right uh, gimmicky but shows you what's in the art of the possible right so these augmented reality apps have since taken off uh, uh, a number of our clients have, have been building uh, have been building real enterprise you know, apps based on this this type of technology and as you saw on the on the video segment uh, if you happen to find yourself not lucky enough with a ticket for one of the show courts, you could point at it at the show court, you'd press, you'd press the button, and you would end up seeing the video, the live video streaming over 3G of the match that was actually happening uh, inside. We had some interesting situations with our clients. We have obviously a, a fairly big hospitality uh, thing going on. You would get a ticket for centre court, or you'd get a ticket for court one, and the match you really want to watch is on the court that you haven't got the ticket for. So we literally had people sitting on court one, like this, watching what's going on on centre court on their, on their mobile devices. Uh, it's fair to say our customer, as a stakeholder, doesn't really think that's a, the, the thing of the future. They'd rather that the people were actually watching. Uh, they'd ban all mobile phones if they could, but uh, in the bowls. But uh, they're not allowed to. <coughs> so that's, uh, and as you saw there, that actually won... Uh, a gold medal from the uh, Digital uh, uh, Marketing Association last year. Uh, as as the, the, the team said on the, uh, on the video, we also had a, these people, what we call scouts, going around the site. So say, you know, they would say, you know, Andy Murray's at, 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 they would tweet, you know, Andy Murray is at, you know, the Orangi Autograph Hut, right? And they would tweet all this information from around the grounds and uh, that would all come into an aggregator uh, on, on the device. Okay. And as Alan Flack said, who's, who's our marketing manager, yeah, we show the art of the possible. That's why we're doing it. So why do we do this? Because we can is part of the answer. Uh, but we also have uh, you know, a marketing uh, and a showcase to do. So we show our leadership in technology. Uh, we show off our hardware brands, System I, System P, and Blade Centers, uh, lots of IBM software behind the website, WebSphere, DB2, uh, lots of Tivoli monitoring to run those data centers. And we show off our services capability, people like me uh, and others. 
and it's a reference, so it's a, it's a good way of us showing, uh, showing our clients what we're capable of. So we host more than a thousand clients at the event uh, during the during the tournament, uh, and we we pride ourselves on our hospitality, not because it's just a nice day out. You know, it's not like you know, there is an element of it's just like going to Henley or wherever, and you're just out for a nice day out. But these are major sea level execs who we then persuade them to come on the behind the scenes tour, where they actually see the capabilities in action and get a po you know. A, a pocket version of what I've talked about today they see demonstrated live they see the people doing the job uh, these are a, 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 a few pictures snapshots of the rooms so this is our control room uh, uh, up top left and, and the web room and just to reiterate that all of that equipment you see all of, everything in there doesn't exist you know, a week, ten days before the tournament it's just an empty shell of a room and it all comes in it's all deployed yeah and all correctly inventorized and yeah, every, we know where everything is we deploy about 200 PCs around the grounds they all have to be locked <laughs> yeah because uh, quite a few people want to take them away uh, and then by three days later uh, after the tournament's finished the truck has left and it's all gone again okay. so we do do it for marketing purposes uh, as well as you know to help the club that's what part of being an official supplier is and we, you know, every now and again, there's a little thing that just shows off how you can use the data in in silly situations. So we were demonstrating some of our Lotus capabilities and how we we sent this information into a, a Lotus uh, product and aggregator. And these were actually in Terminal Five. So if you were during the tournament, if you'd have walked up to the you know, the electronic signs in Terminal Five, it would have given you these pieces of information uh, where it was, you know, it knew it had a script based on. Uh, you know, this was this obviously used current country code, right? So you've got if you're going to Moscow, it was about Sharapova. There was one about you know, if, Fe if Federer was playing, all the Austrian flights would have a would would get some information come up. And this is real time, so this was still you know everything I've talked about the real time feed being in Terminal Five, just like that. So if you happen to turn around and see a TV, the match that score was going to be accurate. Uh, we also had some nice ones when uh, as the uh, rounds were completing, we had arrivals in the third round, and then, you know, so the, it's marketing, it's gimmicky, but it shows what you can do uh, with the, with the data. So, what are we thinking of next? And that won an award as well. So, here are some of the challenges we're we're, we're beginning to look at. So, I guess the three main areas are: if it moves, track it, right? So, we we've got some qualitative, uh, quantitative statistics information there are technologies to track the player and track the ball so you know exactly where the player has moved okay uh, and you know how much they've run so if you watch uh, uh, Champions League football you may see the stat that comes up and says they've run 11,000 11,000 kilometers no that's far too far 1.1 kilometers in, in a match a player so that that is a camera based system which uh, based on uh, military technology which can, tra can track all the objects on the plane at the same time uh, and then you can come up with those stats. So if you apply that to a tennis we've got a heat map here that shows you where the player has been standing. You, their tactics are obviously you can see the tactics almost just by looking at it because there's a Sir Volley guy up over here there's more of a baseline guy or gal on, on that side. If you can track the patterns they're running, you can see how they're reacting to different shots. Okay, you get the distance. You can, again, so that's the data. I give it to my technical consultant, and he says, "All oh, right, now I can come up with a performance stat based on how often they run, how many times we've seen them take food and drink, and all that sort of stuff." So we're getting player health type information to to, to add into the mix. We this doesn't come out very well, but the, you know potentially. You could track the ball as well in real time. So you could augment this. The idea is here showing you an augmented reality application based on the video of the match coming in. Uh, and then you press you know, filters and you would get augmented information of the match. We already do that on the web, but with, with the raw stats data, this is actually adding the tracking data into it. Uh, I, have spot, I have reminded the marketing man that what they... Ha 
you know, their view of that is that I can pick up the iPad, right, with its ca- the new, you know, with the, the new one with a camera in it, and I can point it at the match, and it will overlay that in real time based on the, the what what the what the camera is seeing. I pointed out that's not very doable yet, but it's a target, right? I can do it over video. I can do it over a time sequence video, but I can't do it over live just like that. I'm not quick enough. But he sets me a challenge. This one, which it doesn't come out very well, but another concept we're thinking of is commentary box of the future. Okay, it's a very limited audience, but again, it's, it's augmented reality on a bigger scale. You know, what if I could do a heads-up display in the commentary box? So instead of my, you know, Tim Henman and, and co. having to look at my system, which is down here on a PC, it's all at the sides of their, their field of view, so they can see all the core stats in a heads-up display type mode as they, as they see. Right? Again, limited use. Yeah, it's a tennis tournament, right? So, you know, yeah, what's the use? But you could see it being extra- uh, extrapolated to commercial use, like uh, security command centres and things like that, where at the moment, you know, you're looking at the camera, or, you know, you're looking at the TV monitors, or you're looking at information screens, right? We're doing a lot of work in the security field, where can you change the way that data is presented to the security guard, such they get a much better, better rounded uh, view of the world. So they're the sort of things we'll be doing. As I said, if it moves, track it. Uh, devices, devices, devices. So there will be, a, as we've all seen, the iPad 2 will be around by the time uh, Wimbledon happens. So we'll have to make it work on that. There's been a new release of Android. Uh, so we are, we, we, And we'll be playing with that. And business analytics, which comes back to your point about what do we do with the data, right? What can we turn it into? Can we turn it into information sources? Uh, we can do a lot of performance analysis of players so uh, the the biggest problem I have is I'm not allowed to bet right I have to sign a piece of paper that says I mustn't gamble because I can pretty much predict <laughs> most results yeah, based on some of the data data we see uh, but so can others right so that's why that's why we have to get our data right because there are people out there who need it need it to be right so that's really my sort of whistle-stop journey through some of the infrastructure, some of the business applications we do, some of the reasons we do it. Uh, as I said, it's not my day job, but it's the more interesting uh, part of my job. Thank you. <laughs>